So my life was defined by a revolution. Uh, the Iranian Revolution is one of the biggest uh, popular revolutions in modern history. Um, students, women, men, nationalists, Islamists all poured out onto the street facing tanks to overthrow uh, a corrupt monarchy. And unfortunately, like most, that revolution was hijacked by forces uh, that were unforeseen. So by the time I was born a couple of years later, uh, a theocracy was just cementing its power and we were beginning a bloody war with Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Um, so I was born into that and my mother was a revolutionary. Um, she had stood in that revolution to bring about change and then she resisted the theocracy that kind of ensued. Um, it was, as it turned out, and it still is one of the most repressive uh, Islamic regimes that have ever been, and it targeted women and minorities specifically. So we were made legally to be worth half of what men are worth. And um, that same year, um, as the war began and I was born and, and the theocracy um, cemented its power, uh, a million Iranian women at facing gunpoint poured out onto the streets to protest Islamic dress being enforced upon them. So I stand on the shoulders of Middle Eastern women um, who have silently been resisting this kind of change, uh, including my mother, and are silently resisting this kind of change now. So I just wanted to acknowledge, first of all, the women who are living under repression and in war, and every day are turning up uh, to work outside of the home, to study, and we don't get to see them as change makers, even though potentially they're the greatest of change makers. Um, and again, including my mother, she turned up uh, to university every day with a baby at home and sat in the front row um, until she was every day <laughs> made to move to the back of the, the lecture theatre where the women were supposed to sit. And she refused to take the religious exams um, and as a result couldn't work um, because she thought it was unethical as a psychologist to be uh, assigned a religious uh, affiliation. And eventually we had to leave. So, silenced uh, by religion, uh, we left and we claimed asylum here and we lived um, freely. So I have devoted my life to protecting democracy and protecting the rule of law as someone who has actually seen the world without those things. Um, I went on in that line of work um, as a lawyer to work for the United Nations Tribunals, uh, the Rwandan Tribunal, the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, and the Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Cambodia. Um, <coughs> there, uh, we were helping societies move forward after an atrocity. Um, we were helping them to individualize blame to, to, to leaders, to military and political leaders, so that groups didn't continue to blame each other based on religion or ethnicity or race, and so the cycle of violence could end. That was really important to me. Um, but what was the most interesting kind of work that I ended up doing um, as a lawyer for those tribunals was actually helping to uh, bring women, uh, or bring access to justice for women, bring women into those justice processes. And I was proud as a lawyer um, to highlight and to kind of cement the place of things like violence against women and sexual violence in international law. In the Rwandan tribunal, that meant that we now have recognized rape as um, an act of genocide in international law, where it never was before. Um, in the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals together, we now have rape, uh, enforced prostitution, enforced pregnancy, um, sterilization. Yeah, and I think gender-based violence as well, as uh, substantive freestanding crimes against humanity and war crimes. So that was really exciting, but um, what I also realized eventually was that actually 
we can't have targeted strategies that kind of ghettoise women's input to sexual violence and violence against women. We all know that women are affected by the range of social change and even in natural disasters, we're affected differently. So when we were prioritising sexual violence, for example, and I got to prioritise witnesses and victims in that context, um, it became apparent that we actually need to have women represented as witnesses and victims across the board. So in Phnom Penh, when the city was evacuated by the Khmer Rouge, women were affected differently because they also had childcare responsibilities. They were less able to move. They were sharing their food. Um, and so we started the targeted strategies kind of aiming at women across the board. But that also wasn't enough. Because to paint a picture of what um, international tribunals <laughs> look like, they look a lot like any other high-level uh, public or private sector entity. They're made up of senior-level professionals, a sea of them, who are men, in suits. And if I was to go out on a limb, I'd say they're Western men um, <laughs> from a certain ethnic background. And, you know, speaking French or English or whatever it was, um, and underneath them, there is a sea of women in support roles, and in terms of the international uh, tribunals and in the UN probably generally, a sea of younger, bright, ambitious women who are interns. Um, and at one point, I was the only, I was thinking about this today, I was definitely the only female prosecutor in the tribunal, in the Khmer Rouge tribunal. Um, but I was thinking about it and I realised I was actually the only female lawyer. There were other lawyers there, but they were all legal assistants. So, <laughs> so um, that, was an odd, that was an odd thing and I hadn't thought about it um, until my interns started writing letters and emails and saying, you know, oh, we really want to talk to you, it means a lot to us um, to talk about your experiences as a woman of colour in international law. And I hadn't realised that I was experiencing international law as a woman, let alone a woman of colour, and, but, I, <laughs> but I was, and it meant a lot to them. So, leaving aside the targeted strategies, access to justice for women was going to mean mentoring these women that were coming up in the justice system, making sure that they get made judges, they get hired and, and encouraged and promoted as lawyers, that we also um, hire investigators that are women, interpreters, police officers. We need to mainstream women in our system of justice and actually in public life. So that is access to justice and that is sustainable change. Thank you. <laughs>